Good afternoon, uh, and thank you uh, for coming today. My name is Araceli Tinajero. I'm a professor of Spanish here at the Graduate Center and the City College of New York. On behalf of the Mexican Studies Group and the Wilner Center, welcome to today's panel, Mexican Digital Libraries. Students, colleagues, and friends, thank you ever so much. Your presence means a lot to us. I would like to acknowledge um, the presence of Caterina Toscano, the new director of the Mexican Cultural Institute. Thank you so much, Caterina, for being with us today. I would like to thank the Wilner Center for hosting this event. Over the last five years, Professor Mauricio Font, the director of the center, has been very supportive. Thanks to him, we have been able to organize several events and seminars in our persistent effort to promote Mexican studies and scholarship. I would like to thank our research assistants. Without the rigorous work, these kinds of events will not take place. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Um, two weeks ago, we presented the book Technology and Culture in 20th Century Mexico where the collaborators examine how technology not only transformed the economy, but also the culture of, so of society and the daily lives of the Mexican people. Today's presentation will focus on the wealth of information that can be drawn from the Mexican Digital Library, the BDMX. This project is very unique, and by the end of, this, of the presentation, you will understand why. Digital libraries have emerged due to, due to, due to cyberspace. As a result, res, uh, research methodologies have evolved. In order to keep abreast with the most recent technologies, we must learn about cloud storage, such as Zotero, or Zotero, how do you, how do you pronounce that? Z-O-T-E-O-R-O, -O, Zotero, Evernote, Dropbox, and Google Drive. Unaware, we enter digital research communities. Now we feel the need to organize or research with Zotero or Zotero. More often than not, we are overwhelmed with the development of new tools that count frequency, correlation, visualization, historical documents, and so on. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrea Martinez Barrax, who received her PhD from El Colegio de Mexico. She's a specialist in uh, regal, right? Uh, ethnohistory. This is from the 16th to the 18th centuries. And has published several books on the people and culture of Tlaxcala, a state in Mexico. She's also the author of Cuernavaca Repertoire, Repertorio de Cuernavaca, an exquisite book on the history of this very important city in Mexico. Since 2008, she has directed the Mexican Digital Library for the Mexican National Council for uh, Culture and the Arts, or CONACULTA. And uh, today's discussant is Peter T. Johnson, whom I thank as well for uh, accepting our invitation. Thank you very much, Peter, for being with us. He was Princeton University's bibliographer for Latin America, Spain, and Portugal, and the interim director of the Latin American Studies Program. He's the author of various publications, including bibliographical guides, essays, and chapters, as well as articles largely devoted to Cuba, Peru's Sendero Luminoso, the publishing industry, industry in Latin America, and government documents. Since 1984, he has served on the advisory board for the very important Handbook of Latin American Studies, the foremost bibliographical resource in the field that is compiled by the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress. Let's welcome Dr. Andrea Martinez Barracks first. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming here. Thank you, Araceli, for your generous invitation. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for coming here today. Um, the presentation about, is about the Mexican Digital Library. Uh, no? How about... Within its modest dimensions, the Mexican Digital Library is somewhat an oddity, public and private, academic and public-oriented. Born in November 20, uh, 
2010, its purpose was to provide Mexican historical documents of special interest to the World Digital Library, which was being formed and needed a significant Mexican input for its launch. I received the support of the Mexican Ministry of Culture, CONACULTA, and a small group of first-level libraries and archives, both public and private, INA, uh, the CONACULTA itself, CARSO, and the general archives, el AGN, very important. We quickly decided that we should keep whatever document we sent to the Library of Congress, who runs the, the, the World Digital Library. We must know that Mexicans are very nationalists. And the idea of sending the documents directly to the Library of Congress uh, was uncomfortable for the Mexican institutions, even though it's only to we're only talking about digital digitizations, no? But it's still, there's still a symbolic thing. So we decided to keep all the documents, and that's how we reach this innovation. Why? Because. Uh, Mexican institutions normally, as the general world trend, are digitizing their documents, their main historical documents. And of course, Mexico is no exception. The AGN has tens of thousands of documents or hundreds of thousands. Uh, but what's uh, unique about this project, although it's still very small, is that it's multi-institutional. The idea in the World Digital Library was to make to go uh, towards national uh, archive, digital archives, which is a, of course a very big thing. And in Mexico, there's so many hierarchies that the thing would be okay, but who's first? Who's on top? Uh, and we wouldn't, we would never finish it like, that way. So this project uh, was born in a very low-key way. We, I'm, I'm supported by CONACULTA, but CONACULTA is not on top. Uh, CONACULTA almost doesn't know about this project. And, and so AGN and INA and CARSO, which is a private institution, are comfortable there. And we also decided to keep it simple in terms of not having this big council of, uh, of counselors. We don't have anything. As a matter of fact, it's just me. It's just me and a technician. Yes, and we have a council of the, the directors of the institutions I named. And to the, together, we decide to make special commemorations so we get together. Cinco de Mayo, there was the 150th anniversary. Now we have a pac the Pacific Ocean 500 uh, commemoration of 500 years of its discovery. We get together for special events, commemorations of that sort. But basically, it's just me visiting the directors and deciding with them what documents should, should we put in this digital library. So. I'm working now, uh, it's, we are the founders of four, the four uh, institutions I mentioned, but we have other seven, seven libraries and archives working with us, important ones, El Tec de Monterrey, La Ibero, who have, uh, they have very big and good collections, and also uh, the Real Biblioteca de Madrid, who gave us the, the Sahagún manuscripts they have, more than 600 pages, most of them unpublished till then. They gave them to us. Uh, so we do have a, group, a fine group of institutions working with us, and so we keep it very simple. We get together and we decide what documents with the directors, what documents should we use. So we do, do have some criteria, a very basic. Uh, First of all, it shouldn't be on the web or in, library, in bookstores. We, if it's in the web and you find it with three clicks, it's no use. We're not pretending to work. It's, it has to be useful. And then it has, be, it has to be a document that speaks for itself. You don't have, you do, it's not one letter that makes sense with 100 other letters. It should be a document in itself. It's like, a bit like a museum. 
a bit like an exhibition and a bit like a magazine, a history magazine. It's one document, but the document makes a lot of sense. And so with this criteria, we go very far. And I write, I'm a historian, as Araceli was saying, so I write the introduction for each of the documents and, uh, and with a fine bibliography, and it has to be an up-to-date introduction, serious, but not academic in a heavy way. Uh, we uh, we, we ha do have a sort of criticism towards many of the academic sites on the web because it's like uh, you have to make an effort to, to stay there. Either it's crowded or you have to go through many stages like say who you are and why you are here, why you are there, what do you want, etc. Here it's very simple, you get through Google for example, you go directly to the document, you don't need to pass through the front page, or, um, those kind of things. So we want to keep it very simple, very friendly, but very serious at the same time in terms of historical historical information. So uh, we have had the success because we have like 5,000 uh, readers per month, which is not bad as like a magazine. And, uh, and so far, so we're very happy and going forward, now we're going to, to work with Italy, for example. Somehow this project, because of its modest pretensions, is very welcome. Uh, in many places. So the Italian uh, Institute of uh, Libraries, it's four of them, are going to help us with incredible documents. And this is just an example. We do have like new ideas to go forward in many, in many ways. So this is the, <coughs> the uh, uh, general introduction. And we will have a quick look at the site. Uh, you will forgive m the... It, it was a new computer, so it's a bit jumpy. So we're going to see the start page first. No, it's not a problem. Okay. So this is the first page, and you can see going through the documents. In this case, it's a commemoration, and we're going to. Those were the, the our collaborators or partners, and this is one of the documents we can see of the commemoration. It's a Portolano map, full of information with a compass rose and a fleur de lis, and warnings to the sailors uh, going in the 18th century in the Pacific coast with uh, f uh, funny named uh, small islands like See It On Time or The Inadvertence, uh, Vela Con Tiempo, El Descuido, all over it. It's, it's, uh, uh, parece Vela, Vela Con Tiempo. Uh, there, there they are, like the Vela Con Tiempo and all those. The, the first explorations in the Pacific. Also, you're, oh, you have two screens. Parece uh, Vela, I don't know. Then we're going to see another one by Narvaez. It's a map of the Septentrion or the Northwest. Narvaez was himself a sailor, and he's showing us the discoveries he himself made. He went to the, all the way to Vancouver. He was Spanish, then Mexican. Have all 
also documents like this one of Rodrigo de Vivero, uh, the extraordinary man who went to Japan because he, had, he was in a shipwreck, and he made very good, a very good connection with the shogun, and he established re relations with, uh, between Japan and New Spain, and when he came back, nobody wanted those fine commercial relations because the, now the China was against it, everybody was against it, but it was fun because he did it all by himself. We can explore the site by period, subject, type, and institutions. We're going to start with period. So in 16th century, we can see first the Sagun document I mentioned, a famous part of it, it is the Primeros Memoriales, who have those very uh, well-known uh, paintings of the ceremonies of early 16th century uh, Indians of New Spain. Los primeros memoriales de Sagún. This is one example. And of course, you can zoom in, zoom out, and so it's, you, you can do research with these documents. Uh, serious research, they're all, of course, uh, full, uh, fully uh, edited you know, with all the pages. Another fine example is the Codice Sierra de Chupan, who's uh, uh, incredible because it's a 16th century community, mixed -tech community, and it's their, their spendings and their acquisitions year by year, and it's glyphs, glyphs at the same time it has mixed -tech, uh, glyphs, like the, the, the year, it's like an A, it's like an A, it's, it's mixed -tech. it's mixed -tech. Nahua and it's Spanish to old Spanish with the accounts, the arithmetics uh, of the time. It's an amazing document. We have also a Testeriano Catechism, which is like a comic book uh, before, before the, the monks learned the languages, they would write like that to try to uh, do the conversion version of the Indians. They're called Testerianos. Another example are 67 Indian maps from the National Archives arranged by, by present day states. And we can see here different documents like this one with a, with a hill of a le leopard, the Tepeco and Tepec. Those are 67. There's a Tepec. Okay, so that was 16th century uh, by, by period. We can also go by subject. One of the, the documents I want to show is Guillén de Lampard. Guillén de Lampard, one of my loves, uh, my, my work on him, is a, he's an incredible 17th century Irishman who was in Mexico and he was promoting an independence and the freedom of the Indians, the liberation of the slaves, this is the original documents of his, completely original, and they were never published before, so we do have still original work to do. And you can see how closely you can get to, to actually read every document and his signature, and there's his revolutionary project. Now, also by photography, by type, you can see photography. In this case, we can see Madero. We will see Madero with Madero with uh, Victoriano Huerta, who betrayed him and had him killed. There he is. Madero with Huerta. Also, there's Felix Diaz and Manuel Mondragón, who led the coup d'etat against Madero. Mondragón was the father of Naui Oli, who was on the right side. And there's a young soldier. And finally, we go by institutions and we will choose the INA and, uh, and examples of fine 19th century caricature. This one about Cinco de Mayo, to end with a patriotic uh, note. You can see, why can't they go forward? They are stuck in a maguey. <laughs> and there's another, don't decide my suavos, we will erase from the calendar the Cinco de Mayo. Okay, so that was a quick look, and that's, thank you.
working. Everyone hear me? Yeah, I guess so. Good. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Builder Center, uh, its director, Mauricio Font, and his colleagues for enabling this uh, session to take place and in the continuation of analysis of Mexico, our most important neighbor to the south. Um, it's also, I think this is, and I will be upfront about this full disclosure, I'm a great fan of this site. I think it has a lot of implications as a model um, in terms of curriculum and in terms of motivating the use of primary sources. So that's the disclosure. And what I want to do um, first is to find out from the audience here how many of you have done field research of any type in Mexico for more than a month? OK, a few of you. Good. Um, this, I hope, will encourage everyone to do more work in that country. Uh, what I want to do is cover uh, the following points. One is about collections, putting all of this in a context that's historical, um, because that's my training and the way I look at things. Uh, the second area is implications for organization and access of primary sources, because that's what we're really talking about. And the third is technology and its influence on researchers, um, archivists, and librarians. So let's look at collections. Um, Latin America has a very long and distinguished history of collections uh, by um, the public sector. And by that, I mean not only government organizations and governments themselves, but individuals that were in official capacities. So we have repositories that are extremely rich for more than half a millennia. Uh, especially in Spain, to a lesser extent in Portugal, that will give you a sense about the evolution of a people and uh, the administration. Extraordinary detail. The Archive of the Indies in Sevilla, and, and of course in Mexico, the Archivo General de la Nación, that includes a lot more than just Mexican history. Um, then we have repositories which include as well official material and a lot of printed materials from the 16th, 17th uh, centuries and forward. But we have to balance this officialdom and the official uh, way of thinking with the private sector. And in the private sector, the institution that looms large, uh, of course, is the Vatican Library, the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, in all of its manifestations from convents and nunneries uh, to the church bureaucracy, the Inquisition, and so forth. Um, I hope, given the fact that the sitting pope is a Jesuit and does respect intellectual life, um, that the Vatican Library will be opened uh, far more than it has been in the past. This has been one of our really difficult institutions to crack. Uh, if you think it's difficult in the U.S. or, or Europe, for that matter, with a 35-year rule uh, of, of uh, negating access, imagine a 350-year rule. Uh, so maybe things will improve with the Vatican Library. But also in the private sector, we have a lot of universities that have collected avidly for two centuries, uh, up to three centuries, places like Harvard, Yale, um, Princeton, and research institutes and individuals. There are a lot of individuals out there that have made it a habit to collect both official documents and um, printed materials. And occasionally they've been very generous and have donated. Those of you that have used New York Public Library, the Manuscript Division, um, New York Public, the research part, the Astor, Linux, and Tilden Foundation part, you will find there a good number of important manuscript collections of colonial Latin America that came thanks primarily to collectors. So this mix of public and private sector 
uh, seeking and owning materials in the same categories makes for a lot of dispersed documentation. Uh, it's often difficult to identify who owns what, and sometimes there's very murky provenance. Um, the 19th century antiquarian especially was driven by this sense of collecting, uh, disregarding the context in which the material originated. So provincial archives were often raided. We have a lot of dispersed materials that are difficult to, to recuperate and recover, and yet that has to be part of our intellectual journey as we work through this type of material. The gaps and overlaps that are presented um, really are logistical challenges for generations of scholars. Now, what we have coming here is technology and 21st century thinking. And what the project that Andrea has outlined is really 21st century thinking. It breaks down this anally retentive um, approach to collections which characterized much of the 19th and the 20th centuries that institutions were in competition, therefore we will have something better and it will be only accessible if you physically come to see it. And even when you come to see it, it can be disturbing uh, someone there and you won't be able to see it. One of the important research institutions in this city, for instance, the Hispanic Society, how many have used the Hispanic Society? Great. How many work there? Employees? No employees. Um, <laughs> oh, up until the Hispanic Society is an extraordinary resource for colonial Latin America, uh, as well as a lot of other things, but up in, into the 80s, they had a regulation on the manuscript use that no one could consult a manuscript that had already been consulted until they were notified that the research had been published. So it meant that a large part of the collection was inaccessible, which drew, drove Stanley and Barbara Stein at Princeton, who are colonial historians. They were just furious. Every time they would go up there and they would have a list, and no, oh no, you can't have that. Someone in 1932 checked this manuscript, and we don't know if anything's been published, so therefore our rule is you can't use it. This type of mentality in many ways characterized the types of collecting that was done. Um, and that's why in the 21st century, we're rethinking our ownership, we're rethinking our intellectual responsibilities. And uh, the Biblioteca Digital, uh, frankly, for me, is an extraordinary accomplishment of combining public and private institutional resources. Um, obviously with a lot of difficulties in terms of institutional requirements and personalities that heretofore probably didn't enable this to occur. But it's also a model of cooperation uh, in an international level. And I think there are lessons to be learned from this. Let me move now to the implications for organization and access of primary sources. Um, what we need to do is really be in the 21st century and think about eliminating the limitations on physical use, location, hours, and all of that, and shift in attitude and policy that technological improvements make holdings more widely available. That certainly came with the catalogs, of, with Internet, OCLC, Arlen, now WorldCat. If you haven't used WorldCat, I would recommend it. It's an online database. It has hundreds of millions of records. tells you what libraries have material. It pulls together a lot of information. We do have some good models of collaboration in the Latin American area. Uh, the Center for Research Libraries in Chicago, which exists, it's a consortium with a lot of libraries um, in this country, Canada in part. Um, there is a project called Latin American Microform Project. And it's more than microform. They do digitalization. They do a lot of archives. And you can go to the CRL catalog and look for LAMP, Latin American Microform Project, and you'll see for the last 30 years or so that the contributing libraries that pay a membership have worked together to bring a lot of resources within their libraries together to microfilm, now to digitize, as well as major projects abroad. 
One of the major ones that comes to mind, for instance, is the entire archive of um, Nunca Maish from Brazil that was a secretly recorded and documented archive about the military rule, the torture, the disappearances, and all of that that was done, removed to Switzerland, LAMP through CRL acquired this in Switzerland, and it is then was microfi the microfilm was organized and now it's being digitized. So Brazilians will be able to access this history, grim as it is, but it existed from 64 to 85, 84, 85, um, and it's something that is not necessarily feasible in some other countries such as Guatemala that have gone through uh, similar types of human rights violations. I want to point out the importance of the OCRing and digitalization and transmission. Um, certainly, what we have with the digitized library is a model that can be expanded upon in a number of different ways. On the other side of that, we have a model which I find intriguing is the bibliography of Joseph Sabin called Biblioteca Americana, a dictionary of books relating to America from its discovery to the present time, 1500 to 1926. Sabin is an extraordinary resource bibliographically. And what it is now through Cengage Gale, which is a commercial firm, they have gone out and digitized the complete text, OCR, OCR'd it, the texts for almost 38,000 titles, many of them dealing with Latin America in one way or another, more than 10 million pages. And I've been doing some work on medicinal plants, and so you just plug in the Latin name and you see every single 16th, 17th, 18th century source that, is, that ha mentions that particular Latin name from different countries, different areas. So uh, Sabin, the, it's known as Sabin, the Biblioteca Americana, is really a valuable resource that's online, and assuming your library has it, New York Public has it, um, it can save you an enormous amount of time because you have the full text. It zeroes in, it's all OCR'd, so um, it's, it's somewhat different than Andrea's project, but it's complementary because it does a lot of printed sources. The thing is, the researchers today are expecting internet access for full text database, and this is something that we're battling with uh, to resolve with the Handbook of Latin American Studies. But I think there's also a danger in this, those of you that are teaching and those of you that will be teachers or researchers, that not everything is going to be OCR, not everything's going to be digitized. Uh, you're still going to have to do some hard work in archives, and it's great to go to another country and, and realize how things are. Um, and you're still going to have to learn paleography, and you're still going to have to do a lot of balancing in your research to make sure that you account for the materials in repositories that are not yet part of this digitized world or the internet world. There's a vast array of primary sources uh, with different levels of comprehensiveness. Uh, you really have to realize that it's not all going to be there. And I know that's very difficult for anyone that's been born after 1995 to think that something exists in paper, but it's, it's una realidad. Um, now, this rapid uh, transformation of potential is really amazing in a classroom. And that's why I think this project has such impact in a classroom, because it's all there. You can work with a student, you can work with groups in bringing this type of information, and then they can develop their own projects. And enough of it is accessible. I mean, admittedly, some of it you have to have paleographic skills, but there are other things that if you work at it long enough, you can get it, you can read it. And that's a type of excitement that we can't underestimate in, in importance of bringing things together. Um, a lot of the constraints, though, involve the selection of material for digitalization, the rules for describing the metadata, um, but the implications in the long term is a broadening of scholarship, early familiarity with primary sources, enticing and, if you will, seducing young minds. 
Um, it enables comparative research. That's a whole new area that's going to be feasible far more than it has been in the past. Um, and it also, and I, I'm really think this is not to be underestimated, it raises the standards and expectations for research. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, I tried, it wasn't available. This makes research levels very different. And it's going to lead to revisions of conventional research, conventional wisdom, and it's also going to advance understanding. So in conclusion, I think the Biblioteca Digital Mexicana, it really stands as a model project. If you haven't used it, bring it up, familiarize yourself, make sure your students are interested in Mexico or other areas. There's a lot there that you can use in comparative terms. It's full text, it's online, um, the commentary is excellent for the introduction to the documents, so go for it. Now, many projects strive to provide this broader access to materials, and we're going to see new standards evolving. We'll see certainly a creation of new alliances of institutions in cooperative projects. This is very exciting, breaking down further the 19th and 20th century antiquarian type mentality that has directed so many collections. And there is a distinct place for commercial operators. There are some projects that have such a scale that no one can afford to do it within the nonprofit university world. And some commercial firms are going to have to be able to step in and do this type of thing. So in the end, what we're doing, I think, is shaping a new researcher through earlier exposure, ease of access, but we must also be trained to work and identify and consult sources that aren't in electronic format. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, could you please uh, first identify yourself uh, and, uh, and raise your question? Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much, and thank you so much, Peter, so generous. It really is important for me to, you, to listen to this uh, favorable um, um, I, uh, opinions. I'm not uh, known for giving compliments <laughs> without them well, having meaning. that's even better. That's even better. Thank you very much. About the funding, the, the, I mean, the funny thing is we don't have funding. I mean, the funding is me and a salary, but nothing else. Sometimes in the bureaucratic Mexican style, they say, oh, hello, we would like to visit your installations. No, you and come see the secretaries, the computers. No, it's just me, me. 
It really is. And of course, it's a, there's a lot of things you, ca you can do when there's passion. And it's a funny thing because you would say that for archives and documents, what's passion's got to do with it? What uh, personal initiative? And you can see it's a, a, a project born from uh, the initiative of one person or one idea. It's not like if it becomes too institutional, it will be lost. It, because it's very, it's one by one. It's a one by one thing. <clears throat> so, anyway, you can find documents online, and especially books. It's incredible. I mean, I'm not, of course, I'm not competing with it. You can go, to, I mean, if go to Gallica, for example, of those, that type of, of places where you f will find tons of f extraordinary documents and books, especially books. About documents, some will be well known and some others i think as as peter explained it's an invitation uh, you you put it better than me it's for it like easy access and uh, to start with the documents themselves and get familiarized that can only be good i i do believe in the in the pedagogic uh, strength of, su of such a thing i'm a historian and i for example i did a book, a uh, uh, textbook of history. And one of my ideas, I mean, not mine, of course, but I, that I adopted was to show the documents themselves. Don't tell what was the thinking of this famous man. Give a text of him and make the student l l read it and think of himself, by himself, what to understand in that document. And that's really a very nice teaching. And so that's the idea, read the documents themselves with the help of a fine introduction, some better than others, but with the idea to, to give the basic information. So it can't do any harm. Uh, l let me just to follow up on this, on the selection of materials and whether some will become more popular or dominate. Um, there are several ways of thinking about this. It's one, you may have the documents, but research agendas change. So if you look at the 80s, uh, which rose scholarship on, on women and feminism, a lot of material that had, had great value, but was never read from that perspective. And today we have, if you will, a greening uh, we have all sorts of analysis environment. Uh, I mean, one of the studies, Vasuras by Stanley Stein, which was, came out in 52, is still in print and still being selling in the thousands of copies because he looks at plantations and the transition of the environment, the physical environment, economically, what happened, what happened when you cut down all the trees, you make plantations, sugar ingenues and all of that. So the fact is, here's research done in the 1940s, and no one was talking about the environment, but it's all in that text, and it's being reread, but with different eyes. Uh, the archive of the Indies, when they started digitizing, they did the, the legajos that were the most popular, the ones that people used so much, so you don't use them anymore, you use the, the CDs. So I, I know what you're saying, I know that concern, but I think once people see what's there, the logical next step is to move to next set related materials. So this is to entice you in, if you will. Uh, this is basically Mexican. About Mexico, uh, the document can be somewhere else, but it is about Mexico or the Pacific, yes, related to Mexico or New Spain, Spanish. Spanish and, well, uh, indigenous languages and also perhaps Latin. 
but uh, it's Mexican, Mexican related. Excuse me? No, it's, it's everything. It's everything. It's from, we have, well, from the revolution to the conquest, backwards. We don't have limitations of subjects and time, which is, of course, immense. But as Peter was explaining, I mean, you can go through different, uh, there's a story about the subjects and the interests. And you can go to so many places. Uh, it's just the way of looking at things with originality, trying to find something new to say about, about uh, or to find about the, the subjects. No. Uh, well, I think you raise an important point because in this, the Mexican group of documents, as you work through it, there are many points in common because it deals with colonialism. It deals with that imperial project of administration, how it works, who is subjugated, who is eliminated, uh, and, the, and the nature and ex of extractive industry of wealth and revolution. So I think whether one's a Mexican historian or a Brazilian historian, it's valuable to know the other side of the continent to do a more sophisticated reading of your own materials. But for, for Brazil, uh, there's a huge amount that's now, now recorded. The question more is in Portugal, and the Gulbankian Foundation has funded certain projects that, that do do that. But Portugal is not a very wealthy country in some ways. So it doesn't quite compare with Mexico. Yes, at first we were going to include music and we, we had this uh, a collection of folk, folk uh, gravaciones, what do you say, Regist recordings, uh, fantastic, we, we didn't go through it, uh, but we do still, still think about those things, photographic collections too, why not, why not, it's just what happens first, uh, but music, it's probably technically possible of course, it's well. It will it will make it bigger, heavier, but it's still possible. We'll try to do it. How, what did you say at the end? Yeah, the uh, technical aspect is done by, by in Conaculta. There's a part-time uh, colleague working on that, uh, doing, putting the, the documents and arranging the site. Uh, that's all, and uh, and I choose the documents, and that's and I work with the directors and with the other directors, but that, that's all I could say about it. It's very simple.
No, also we have uh, so we have some books. Uh, well, photographs. Yeah, and photographs, different maps. different uh, documents and maps. Yes, uh, I don't work with. Well, I do have contact, especially with the World Digital Library, but I don't do not have contact direct contact. What I do is with. Yes. My idea is that once is enough. If it's there, it's there. So, and, and another thing is I don't, I don't use links. Why? Because it's a whole thing in itself. Links are hundreds and they change all the time. And it's not good if you give a link and you go there and it's not there anymore. It happens. So I decided not to put links. Anyway, uh, when I, I have a new idea of a document, I go and go into the web and see if I find it. If I find it easily, for example, now I'm working with the Marsh Library in Ireland, and they suggested the um, Hernandez, the Hernandez, the plants, the this encyclopedia of plants done in the 16th century by this man Hernandez. It's a huge thing, it's in, amazing. And I thought it was basically published by Spain recently and I said, okay, thank you very much, but no. And then I found out that they, they don't have the same edition. But sometimes it's just tricky, I mean, it's serious. Uh, research. It's not the same edition, and anyway, so serious researchers I know tried to find it and never could. And if they couldn't, it's, it, for me it's, it's a sign that it's really difficult, so I'm putting it, I'm very happy because it's a true contribution, it's a very, very important document. So that's how I go. If it's already in, in another, in Cervantes or somewhere else, fine. I don't need it. I mean, if the researchers... Yeah, we can do. It's enough to do some things. You, I, it's even if I try to do it bigger, no, one at a time. No. Um, for now, yes, because it's not easy. It's not easy to have the same criteria. I tried. I tried to have a, a, a second person, but I mean, I, it's not like it's not unique. But anyway, you have to be careful. You have to know the documents. You have to be a, uh, an, a historian and know the know your your field. You no. Know? So it's not impossible for, it's, but I don't want it to be bigger. I don't want it to lose control. That's one of the things, no?
right. I, I haven't thought really well what's going to happen. It was bad enough to change uh, sexenio in Mexico because it was, <laughs> I do need a salary. And it was bad enough this year. And so, yes, we have to think. We have thought to migrate it into a public-private thing. That would be an idea, not to depend only on Conaculta. But uh, what I know, that what is true, is that I think many projects, especially in Mexico, we have this very bureaucratic instinct, or tendency, to make it big, very complicated, with council and specialists and uh, the wider you think, the more blurry it becomes. That's my idea. And so that's, I, that I don't want, it, don't want to happen. So you can think of doing hundreds of things, but uh, as it's, as, well, being simple is uh, an alternative for now. No?